here to the University of Central Florida from the Global Carbon Project, where my mind was about trying to get all of the sciences involved that are relevant to understanding the global carbon cycle and then managing, if we could, global warming from, the, um, from where we live. Um, and that means uniting the natural and social sciences as we live now in an era that chemist, Nobel laureate chemist Paul Crutzen has labeled the Anthropocene. And given that, we, it, I mean, that title of this era is to suggest that we have made such a contribution to the whole global climate, the whole global climate, that we also have to be responsible for that contribution, and we're a little bit out of um, whack with our over-contribution, if you will. Now, I forgot my... I forgot my electronics. So do I point it here? Point it here? Or will you just go to the next slide? Um, these are a few headlines from newspapers around the world. The Sacramento Bee reporting that ozone is found to harm the lungs of children. The, a green group says diesel soot is a big cancer risk. Hong Kong joins China pilot pollution control scheme. A study says black carbon emissions in China and India have climate change effects. Volunteers don pollution detectors in the European Union. Hong Kong air pollution hits record high, says the Associated Press. An Asian smog impact needs five years study, says the United Nations. And earlier today we heard that the phosphorus levels in our Everglades are influenced by the Sahara Desert. The point is that the air is a, is a common resource, a common pool. So we have to think of our universe and think how uniquely we um, are positioned. There is no other planet where we can live. And this planet and all that protects us from the, huge, from the whole outside world are two somewhat magical blankets. One, a blanket of ozone, or O3, which protects us from harmful UV beta. That is, what, and we're worried about depleting that layer of ozone through the chemicals, the synthetic chemicals that we have made starting in the 1930s. The Montreal Protocol of 1987, about to um, enjoy its 20-year um, anniversary, has done great, made great progress to restoring the ozone layer that we need. The other protective blanket is the blanket that Dr. Anna Unra Cohen spoke about today, and that is the blanket of CO2 emissions. It turns out that CO2 emissions blanket is, is again, one of the reasons why we can live on this planet. It has kept the planet at about 59 degrees Fahrenheit for hundreds of thousands of years. We like greenhouse gases. We must have them. It's the enhanced greenhouse effect since the Industrial Revolution that is worrisome. Because we are taking the carbon that has been produced over millions and millions of years and adding it to the blanket and at such a fast rate that other systems are challenged. So it turns out that since the Industrial Revolution, we have increased the blanket's warming warmth, if you will, by about 25%. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This, um, our atmosphere itself is primarily made up of nitrogen and oxygen and that's about, and carbon dioxide, and that's about all I need to know as an environmental sociologist. Next. <laughs> Next. This is a portrayal of, of ozone around the world, and you can see the biggest thing to notice is that there are differences in the concentration of our, the, the gases in our air that are hemispheric in nature. They're also determined by topography and other kinds of local climate conditions. Next slide, please. In this picture, I'm trying to show the um, 
the planet Earth at the bottom left, and you can see Mount Everest in the troposphere, and then there's that stratospheric ozone layer protective blanket, and then all over this, um, the whole thing together um, is, is extending out into what we generally call the atmosphere. The CO2, two oxygens and one carbon, that makes up the greenhouse gas is this blanket that we like at if we have it at about 290 parts per million, which it has been for hundreds of thousands of years. Next slide, please. I couldn't get this all on one slide, but this is the way that, that um, uh, atmospheric um, scientists divide up our atmosphere um, into different layers. This is, so the stratosphere is at the bottom where you see the weather balloons, and then meteors in the mesosphere, and then the thermosphere, and then the exosphere. In contrast to the Earth, this blanket of protection called our, our atmosphere is about the size of as thin as a nickel around a basketball. So what we change in this little blanket area around the, our Earth is particularly delicate. I mean, we don't want to mess it up. It's the way this Earth exists in the vastness of the whole universe, and there's no other place for us to live. Next slide, please. The sources of carbon dioxide, that is carbon and then um, burning it, are natural. We have, in terms of forest fires and the natural decay of plants, trees, and animals like ourselves. We also have certain human activities that are responsible and have added to the CO2 in increasing, at an increasing rate. This is the burning of fossil fuels, the processes we call industrialization, including manufacturing processes, urbanization, and removing forests and other um, intensive agricultural practices. All of these have carbon, and all, uh, when added uh, to oxygen, they all become carbon dioxide. Next slide, please. Um, Anna showed us the, that the global carbon cycle was really composed of four major components, atmospheric, land, soil, and ocean, and that carbon circulates um, among these four major systems. And I've put a, over here in red the human dimensions where you see the fossil fuel emissions and the changes in land use. And there are only four places for, for the carbon dioxide to go. These are the four places. And it turns out that we've oversaturated the atmosphere. We're almost close to um, reaching some um, dangerous levels of carbon in the oceans. And we really can't, and we were high tech, maybe we'll be able to sequester carbon in uh, underground. But the biggest, um, I mean, so our major, our major options in terms of what the hu human beings can do is to handle the things that we're doing the best now. That is, to alter our processes of manufacturing, urbanization, industrialization, and land use change. Next slide, please. This portrays five systems in the global carbon climate human system with um, carbon dioxide as a spanner in a climate wheel that has atmospheric, uh, uh, pro atmospheric implications as well as um, disastrous effects with ecosystem and human responses. That is, in the bottom center, in the green portion, we, s we know that all of the changes that, are res that we are contributing to in terms of the way the globe has to respond to this new condition that is a condition that the globe has never known as far as we, can, we know, looking historically, we know that we're going to have responses from our ecosystems and we're going to have responses from our human systems. What we hope is that we're smart enough that our human responses are in time. Next slide, please. So the two major contrib contributors to um, the air pollution, if you will, of our atmosphere come from land use change and the combustion of fossil fuels, and you can see them in proportion um, from um, 1850 to 2000, which is, we always are talking about this as sort of the, the uh, mid of the Industrial Revolution when this is started. Let me remind you or, uh, that this level that we see in 1850 of carbon 
um, of uh, the burning of or the production of CO2 and the changing of land use was essentially was a straight line backwards at that same level for less than this or level at this same level for hundreds of thousands of years. So this portrays the dramatic and abrupt contribution that we have made since the Industrial Revolution. Next slide, please. And um, so the earth is a little warm. And as a good mother, I need to give an ice bag for the headache or for the warmth. Um, as CO2 has risen almost in lockstep form, so has the global temperature, and that's what we refer to when we talk about global warming. Next slide, please. Another way to think of global warming is to see the change in the ladies, um, what do we call them, <laughs> foundational garments, and we will see that since the 18th century, we've uh, gotten warmer and um, so we've gone from bloomers to bikini underwear. Um, I'm saying, I'm, I'm describing this for our listeners um, who are not seeing this picture today. Next slide, please. In terms of per capita energy use, there are also differences around the world. Um, the red line portrays the United States per capita energy consumption. The green is Japan, the yellow Taiwan, the South Korean example, and you can see it rising, and then China um, until 2000 was fairly stable. Next slide, please. Looking at variation, we also have to appreciate that different places and different land uses, different living conditions, produce different kinds of, um, or different uh, sources of carbon dioxide. This is a comparison of energy use in four Asian cities, and you can see the two more industrialized examples of Tokyo and Seoul do not have very many um, uh, emissions from manufacturing, but in fact are kind of typical of an advanced um, uh, industrial city in that it's mostly consumer driven with commercial and transport activities. In fact, Tokyo is actually outperforming other Asian cities because of its energy efficient technologies, dense living arrangements, and cleaner fuel mix. Seoul's emission profile is essentially the same. As a less developed city, Shanghai's emissions stem predominantly from industry. In general, developing cities need to focus on cleaner industrialization whereas already developed cities need to focus on transportation, consumption, and service industries. The majority of energy in Shanghai and Beijing is produced from coal-powered energy, and they both have large manufacturing sectors today. The point being is that if we're going to solve this problem, we have to appreciate the variation in the places where we live and the opportunities that each place has um, to contribute to the solutions. Next slide, please. In Florida, I've just, I'm not, I'm just new to Florida, so I'm not going to be able to be too um, helpful to Florida, but I do see this exposure to coal fire powered plants. Next slide, please. And I did look up the air quality index and find that, fl that Florida is good in all, in all indicators of air quality. Partly that's due to our lucky condition of being a peninsula and where the winds blow our pollution outwards. And so for us, the adage, the solution to pollution is dilution, works. But other places like Denver, Colorado, the pollution in Beijing, it's hangs low and cannot escape and be a part of the pollution elsewhere. Next slide, please. So I want to think of the dynamic Earth as being com composed of unique, special places with different ways of contributing to solutions. Next slide, please. And, and I also want to think of the Earth as different places where those climate systems vary. And so the way that the Earth's global system will respond to this global temperature increase means that the weather systems in different places will be different. 
droughts may be happening in one place, whereas there may be more severe floods in other places. There may be more severe and, in, and greater in frequency of storm systems like hurricanes and the like. And all of this means that we will have, no matter what kind of condition I am dis, uh, yet you're examining, that we will have something on, the, on our agenda called environmental refugees people who are having to move from their community elsewhere because the, of the responses to, um, that, the, that the planet Earth needs to make as it tries to manage its own temperature. It also means havoc with economies and certainly is a big issue for environmental justice as, as so many people are not responsible for the environmental um, pollution that is causing these problems and yet will suffer um, the consequences. Next slide, please. This is a, a portrayal of a model of what Florida would look like um, at, probably at the end of the century if indeed we have the, the two major catastrophes at the, at the poles when we're talking about melting of ice shelves. And I think you saw this also, a similar kind of um, image when um, Dr. Um, Unra Cohen was speaking about Florida conditions and the loss of our coastline. Next slide, please. And this, this slide is taken from a composite from satellite pictures showing electricity use around the world. And you can see how there's quite a difference between the northern and southern hemispheres and why we can call um, Africa the dark continent. You can also see the e extremely illuminated um, country of Japan and the eastern seaboard of the United States. Next slide, please. So with one degree change in the average global temperature in one, the past 100 years, we know we've had tremendous effects already. Glacier, glacial, glacial and polar ice melt, sea level rises, natural habitats, and disease vector changes. What is a disease vector change? To me, it means that mosquitoes are going to be able to live at more places, and, and mosquitoes who carry diseases. For example, Nairobi is, is located at a very high altitude, and, and partly that was because mosquitoes couldn't live there because it was too cool. Now it's warmer and warmer, and the mosquito level is rising up, and the diseases that, mo that mosquitoes are carrying um, is um, going along right with the warmth. Next slide, please. So places vary in their carbon cycle, human cycle, from farms to forests, next slide please, to small towns, to small cities, to hypersprawl hyper and megacities. Next slide please. So I like to think of each place as having its own configuration of these six variables that make up the poetics of the place the configuration of population dynamics and, co and constitution, its social organization, especially its social inequality, its eco-environment, its technology, its social institutions, and its culture. Each place has a different configuration of these variables, and only when you understand those, that configuration can you think of viable um, levers for social change, if it is indeed the social drivers of global warming in the Anthropocene. Next slide, please. In terms of policy, um, we've heard a little bit about the Clean Air Act of 1990, the Energy Policy Act of 2005, President Bush's Clear Skies Initiative, and we've heard that there are state and regional regulations, standards, and PACs. I'm happy to announce that today the Supreme Court announced a decision that um, greenhouse gases are a pollutant under the um, Clean Air Act of 1990. That means that uh, the EPA does have the authority and the responsibility to be acting on behalf of the public 
to protect us from greenhouse gas emissions and their consequences. This was, um, it also um, set the, uh, it also ruled, the court also ruled that the states that brought this federal, this suit against the EPA, um, uh, Massachusetts and about 13 other states and 13 other um, uh, special districts, I believe, and some NGOs, that though they have the standing in the court to sue the EPA on our behalf. Next slide, please. When I talk about the poetics of place, I'm talking about understanding the underlying causes of regional carbon budgets. Now we know on two, there are two sides of the story. One is the land use side for deforestation and urbanization, and the other side is the energy side, that is the CO2 emissions, and of course these two are related. And we have to think of them in terms of a balance. So the carbon budget of an, of an area is a balance. It's a budget between, it's just like your own household budget. And, but if we really want to change that budget, we have to understand the poetics of places, especially of regions, as how they can alter their configuration of those variables to make the poetics different so that they, uh, the the, uh, the outcome would be a different regional carbon budget. Next slide, please. At the Global Carbon Project, um, we were trying to get all of, all of the sci relevant sciences together in terms of a new idea about the way science is conducted. And that is a, a, an idea of not earth sciences, but earth system sciences that understand the importance of the social sciences in the mix of scientific pursuit. Hi, I'm going to speak about uh, relating the water cycle or water resources budgets to uh, the carbon dioxide cycle. I'll look at it from a global aspect, and then from a global aspect, I'll take it right down to, uh, to, uh, to the local aspect. So uh, water resource stewardship is, is what I'm really trying to get across, and we're going to be doing that uh, as related to the carbon cycle. Uh, major benefits, uh, preservation of vegetation is needed to balance the hydrologic and carbon cycles. If you take one thing away from here, I want you to go home and plant four trees, okay? And then I want you to water it, and I want you to make sure that your local, national, and inter even international people know to balance the water budget and balance the carbon dioxide budget. That's, that's, the, that's the thing I'm trying to get across to you, and I'm going to show that uh, all these things I've set up here, my major beliefs are, are, are really true. Certainly, I think the carbon cycle is connected to the water resources cycle. By balancing these uh, budgets, we'll help reduce heat islands. How many of you have been out on a roof recently, like a roof on this building? You know, on this building, we get up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And 145 on the Energy Star roof, okay? I'll show you later how you can knock that temperature down. The uh, heat island effect is all around you, and we can, we can really minimize that. We could also help uh, reduce droughts and floods. Whenever you have, whenever you denude an area, deforest it and so forth, more runoff, faster runoff, more floods, and uh, there's more extremes in the weather condition. And of course, when you balance the, hydro, when you balance the hydrologic cycle, you're going to be balancing that carbon cycle. You're going to make an effort to balance that, or, or make a contribution to balancing the carbon cycle. When you do that, your heat island effect will be minimized. And I, that's why I say, yes, water resources play an important role. Uh, just quickly, a water budget, if, what happens if you pave everything over? What happens to the rainfall? It runs off, right? Before you paved it, most likely it went into the ground unless you had clay soils, and much of that water went into the ground. Okay, so you've got to balance the water budget, and that's what we're trying to do, and, and it's, it's possible, even economically possible. In a developed condition, you do lo lose water, okay? Many of our streams in the world the stream flow has definitely increased on a volumetric basis, and that is because we haven't been good stewards of keeping water on the land. Here's an example. Pave everything over, nothing goes into the ground, everything goes into runoff. Some will go into evapotranspiration, of course. Okay, in addition to the natural fluxes of carbon through the Earth's system, anthropogenic, meaning human, particularly from fossil fuel burning and deforestation. We haven't heard much about deforestation, but boy, it's, it, it's a player in, in this whole carbon dioxide cycle, as, as we've seen uh, by, by most scientific investigations. Source of this is NASA and the Earth Observatory. 
no matter how you look at these, uh, at these figures, uh, the oceans, because of the uh, carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, is putting more into the, in, in, uh, the oceans are getting more carbon dioxide. However, your fossil fuels over here are certainly returning more, also cement manufacturing, returning more to the environment. But over here on this side, you'll find out that vegetation, what happens with vegetation? The more carbon dioxide you take in, the trees get fatter, right? So therefore, they gain carbon. Do you ever hear of a tree getting skinny or bulimic trees? No, okay? They get fatter. They, they grow on, on food. Carbon dioxide is one of those things that, that, that they need. So this is important. Sources are, are all on these graphs, uh, so you can go back and check the sources. Uh, the units on these are in gigatons. Gigatons is a, a, a billion ton, okay? A, a, one gigaton is a billion tons. Multiply that by 2,000, you have 2,000 trillion tons, or 2,000 trillion pounds, 2,000 pounds per ton. So these are, these are big numbers, but in all cases, the difference is over here, vegetation can actually sequester or take in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Fossil fuels will continue to give off uh, carbon dioxide into the environment and cement over here. O oceans, again, uh, can be a depository. Uh, no matter what reference you go to, you'll find out that uh, these trees or, or vegetation, which is woody type, there's a net flux in. In this case, it's given as 1.4, but there's always a buildup or there's a buildup of carbon dioxide in the environment. And notice what's driving all this. Is that the hydrologic cycle? Yeah, the hydrologic cycle, it pumps it, okay? That's where you, you know, evapotranspiration or transpiration out of trees is because of the amount of water that you're losing back into the uh, atmosphere. Uh, again, no matter how you look at it, uh, no matter what source you want to use, you'll find out that photosynthetic activities and vegetation is one of the, one of the players. Okay, what could be our policy? Uh, clear land should be replanted. All right, I think that's, that's dry wood is about 50% carbon, okay? So you're, you're actually uh, putting carbon in, 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 into your wood. Old, old forests and so forth could be replanted, and uh, by replanting them, you'll also then sequester or gain carbon from the atmosphere. And why not increase the vegetation, replace these old vegetation? I don't think it will help balance the hydrologic and uh, the carbon cycles. Okay, since 1620 in the United States, that's what we look like in 1620 in terms of mature forests, okay? In 1850, 1920, and of course, we still, over here on the west coast, uh, we're still uh, knocking some of the forests down. In fact, I believe 80% of them or so is, uh, is expected to be lost. So in the United States, uh, you know, we could add to what we're losing, what we call the BRIC nations. BRIC is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Okay, those are your big fossil fuel users besides us. If you're looking at a resource like wooded resources, you can replace India by Indonesia, and it's still a brick because they have a lot of, a lot of uh, wooded vegetation in, in, in those countries. Add also the Canadian losses, you'll see we're losing a lot. But now consider replanting only four times or the more uh, on the current level in 1620. In 1620, we had 100 units. Now we have 10 units because we have 90% loss. If you, if you make four times that much, it'll be up to 40. So you're, you're increasing the mass of the forest by four times. If you increase the mass, that means that you'll also increase the amount of carbon dioxide that you're sequestering from, uh, from the atmosphere. Take whatever number you like. I happen to pick 1.4 gigatons going into vegetation. That ends up at 5.6. Remember, fossil fuels in the examples I give were about 5.5. So what are you going to go? You're going to go home and you're going to plant how many trees? Four, unless you're me. I plant five because I don't have a, you know, I, I, one usually dies. So maybe plant five. In, uh, the land I'm now living on, I planted eight more because, uh, because my house also covered some. So basically, uh, you know, in seriousness, you know, it, 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 it will work. If, if you keep on making sure you balance the hydrologic cycle, plant those trees, and uh, however, we can't get the rest of the world to do it, can we? Okay, it's hard enough getting my city to do it, although we have a progressive city. Lou and I live in Winter Park. We are pretty progressive in terms of uh, replanting of trees. But, you know, you, you can do it all over, and I think you should make it an issue. Make, make, make sure it does get done. Preserve our wetlands then, and replace hard surfaces with vegetation. Create green roofs. That green roof uh, is on top of this student union. If you want to see it, go up to the third floor. 
and go to the southwest side of the building. You'll see the green roof on this building. What's it doing? If that, if that was a roof that was returning uh, uh, heat to the atmosphere, it's reducing the heat. On that green roof, in the summertime, the temperature's between 85 and 90 degrees. What I tell you it was before? 165 when it's real a dark roof and about a 145 when it's the best energy saving star roof money can buy, okay? All right, so it's reducing the heat, heat that's being released. It's also returning water to the environment and it's also creating woody plants. All right, so there's a lot of benefits to doing this besides stormwater management and by the way, we're saving because in this building we're now using less energy. The Florida Solar Energy Center doing the investigation up there saying we're using 18% less energy in this building during the summertime for air conditioning and we're using 45% less in the wintertime. Just think that translates to fossil fuels, doesn't it? And the reduction of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. So plant a green roof too. Uh, it was out in San Francisco uh, about three months ago. They're putting green roofs on many of their healthcare facilities. Who knows why? They get the patients out a day early. Okay? Isn't that nice to get out of a hospital a day early? Also, you're taking a bed that only costs $150 a day when you could be using that bed for intensive care at $2,000 a day. It's a money-making decision on their part, but it's also a community decision because they're really replacing the green areas. My first green roof I looked at and examined was the Gap Building, which is south of San Francisco. Been in Portland, uh, Chicago, and in Philadelphia over the last two years. Portland has an aggressive policy. I love Mayor Daley in Chicago. He says, try me. You will build a green roof on your building, or else you will not have this building. Okay? One of the big box stores was the first to lose against Mayor Daley. Okay? You can do these things. It's being shown around the world. And Germany has the most aggressive program for, for green roofs. And, uh, and that's the green movement that started in Germany about 40 years ago. We can start it here. Ah, if you want to build a home, you say, oh, these are commercial establishments. The new American home for the United States has a green roof on it, OK? And it works. It collects all the water. We're saving about 95% of the water, which falls on that piece of property. Not to mention the fact that we have a beautiful area for wildlife, okay, which you see over here, and also a lot of plants that, uh, that we're growing on that. And here, here's my temperature graph. This is uh, 48 hours. Here's the non-green roof, and here's the green roof. This is in August, okay? Okay, that's the actual data. That's, that's not made up, real, real data. All right, stormwater management, bringing it back to the local level. You've heard other speakers talk about post equal pre-volume matching, and there's a lot of ways you can do it. Certainly, you want to disconnect the directly connected impervious areas. You want to keep the water on site, and there's lots of ways of doing it. Of course, I have green roofs first. You have parking lot retention, cisterns off your homes, reverse berms, plants that require a little water, preserve depression areas, et cetera, et cetera. I like this one, pervious parking. Newsweek, this past Newsweek, uh, has an article of what the United States should be like. We should be like Europe because they have pervious pavement almost everywhere. They're putting water into the ground. So they're talking about balancing. We should be like, meaning the U.S. should be like. And here's, here's, that, uh, here's that example. Holes that make roads better, it's called. Okay? <laughs> and they relate it back to, hey, you can still drive cars on these things. Okay? Pervious pavements. Stormwater management off-site, I just talked about some on-site, uh, especially in the various parts of the world uh, that I've been in, regional ponds are, are, are certainly, the Middle East has a lot of re regional ponds. Uh, purchase of lands for recharge, we do pretty, that pretty well in uh, some parts of the United States, and Texas, and certainly here in the state of Florida. So our goal, post is less than or equal to pre. This is the thing you're concerned about, volume, okay, volume, keeping the stuff, keeping the water on-site. Preserve that. It's, and there's a whole host of uh, toolbox things you could use. I mean, uh, you know, and there's nice pictures here. Here's a pervious parking lot. Uh, here's downtown Orlando here, uh, a bunch of exfiltration pipes going in. All over the world I have uh, sites for. This one comes out of Germany when I was flying into Germany. Over 30% of the roofs are green there. Isn't that nice? 
That's a whole office complex. Anybody want to guess what office complex, what, what corporation that is? You're right. Mercedes. You win. Okay? Mercedes. You win at Mercedes. Uh, Penelope will give it to you. <laughs> this is the world's largest zip code building. It's the old Montgomery Ward building in uh, Baltimore. And it has now a green roof. It's, it's now an office complex and so forth. Uh, this is right here in, uh, in Winter Park. Uh, that's the Civic Center. There's a nice uh, pond there. We're using that for recycling. All kinds of reuse projects, keeping water on the ground. Who wants to pay $3 per thousand gallons? You heard somebody say that earlier, right? Kirby Green said that. That's what we're going to. Well, I tell you, on the West Coast, they were going to $5 a thousand gallons. And, and you know, more than half of that water, it's potable water, is going to water in your grass. How silly. Why not use storm water? Just save it. Pay 50 cents a thousand gallons. You know, you could even get a Florida Public Service Commission franchised area so no one else can come in and bother you. Okay? You can get a franchised area. Sell this water. You can make, make money and save people money. 50 cents a thousand gallons. Okay? Here's, here's one of my first uh, sites, a uh, little office complex. Reuse of stormwater. That was a cistern that I just showed you. Uh, solving problems uh, by local governments. I was involved with the Wakaiva. And there's master plans you can use, public education. This is a big one. Make sure people understand what's, what's going on. And then the funding. You can fund all these things with the utilities. Uh, key elements, uh, minimize clearing, protect vegetation, plant four trees, right, for every in your neighborhood. Let's, let's, let's make five times more if you're me. Or Pete Panousis, he has the five. Uh, promote clustering, okay, preserve vegetation, reduce imperviousness, all these things. FNY, FYN, who knows what that means? Florida Yards and Neighbors Program, okay? It's basically keeping water on site, keeping native vegetation, and, pr and promoting vegetation. Stormwater master plans can be developed, and they have been developed. You'll minimize problems for future growth. And in conclusion, I just want to say that all these things are related. The carbon cycle is related to the water cycle. I want you to preserve vegetation. I want you to help with atmospheric problems. I want you to go home and plant those four trees. And you can do it this week. You don't have to do it tonight. Okay, but Let's remember you're going to do that, okay? Thank you.